it's just important that we stay in a space, Felicia, I believe this in my heart. It's important that we stay in a space where we open and we're allowing God to, to fulfill his promises in our lives. And one of his promises is that we will be delivered from some old ways. And sometimes those old ways are so old that it takes somebody else to say a thing or two to trigger something. You know, and when you were talking, Felicia, what I thought about is how I come to know God. There's a scripture, uh, Isaiah 54, 13, and it says something like this. They will be taught by the Lord. And he's telling me that your sons will be taught by the Lord. And then it talks about that they will have success. But that success was talking about the peace that your children will have. But that you will be taught by the Lord. And so when I see it, I ask, my, I ask myself certain questions because I know that if I'm going to teach it, I'm going to have to experience it. Otherwise, I won't have the words to give you from a what I will call a real-time space situation. And I ask myself, again, it's Isaiah 54, 13. Jill, how is it? How, how do you say that? What do you do with that being taught by the Lord? And I recognize, at least at this level of understanding I have, I may know something better later, but that the way I am taught, I am taught by the Lord because I am intentional about staying in truth. I'm taught truth is your teacher. How do we know? Because he said that I will send you the spirit of truth, and then he also refers to that same spirit as a counselor, a helper, and a teacher. And that spirit, the Holy Spirit will teach you, will guide you into all truth. So I, I remember when I was talking about freedom, and I'm trying to teach people and share about, uh, with women on how to get through and get to freedom. But it's the truth that sets you free. And somehow I couldn't figure out why are we circling? Why am I not seeing these, this, this fruit and this manifestation of God's truth in, in some people's lives? And it's simply this. Because freedom without truth is not freedom. It's fantasy. It's a story. And it's a story you can tell. It's a life you can live. But it absolutely doesn't lead, lead to freedom. On my way here, I said, you know, I feel like someone who has new words about flesh die. And I think that's because I was reading a book about relationships. Yeah, please do pass out the lessons you all. They're going to pass out some things to you, okay? Pass out the lessons and the, all the handouts, okay? So I said, I was reading this book, and the book just, a statement in the book was that uh, 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 suffering is in happiness. And I know suffering is in happiness. But there's something, I had to sit with that for a minute because I also understood, listen, I would be lying to you if I said I didn't suffer in marriage. And I would be lying to myself. But I knew to go past the human understanding of that. And I understood, see, today I don't look at my life, Eric, so much that I'm suffering. I look at it that my flesh is dying so my spirit can live. So now I can read that and I can know that mm, and sometime I would have read that book and been on divorce court somewhere or at somebody's court because it's so much of you. everything should feel so right. But I, I know that's not true. I know that's not true because of my... What I mean by that is true and not in the way they said it, in the way I perceived it. Because your children will make you suffer. And you can't divorce them. And so that's how I know that, wait a minute, you need a little bit of that and you'll find out it'll grow you up. It just takes you sometimes to get to past 50 for all of it to converge and come together. And, and now you just be that. I'm not, I'm not trying to figure some certain things out anymore because I've had enough experiences in the wilderness to appreciate the wilderness. Now, I don't like the wilderness, but what, the, what life has done for me, it has grown me to know 
trouble don't last always. And now I'm not quoting somebody's song. I'm not quoting somebody's grandmother. It is my truth. So now I can fight a little bit in that wilderness. But I want to talk to you today just a little bit about this lesson is entitled, uh, You Don't Know Me. And we'll, we'll get to what, all of what that means. Do you all have a lesson in front of you? Good. So I'm going to start with something. Some of this is something I did with the ladies in um, D.C. jail, and it was a hit with them. So I figured it set the captives free in there. It set the captives free in here. Those captives was acting like they were free, and they were still locked down. So if they could get over it and find some happiness and a bit of joy over the word of God or over a truth of God, because I didn't have to, I didn't use scripture with them. I just talked to them. But anyway, let's go. So here's what I want you to listen to, and then we'll get to the part of your lesson. We, we, we talked about breaking uh, historical agreements. Breaking historical agreements is about ridding yourself of learned behaviors. Why is that important for me to say? And I think it, it should probably be said in your household or while you're looking in the mirror over and over again. Because these things have been there for a long time, and these behaviors, they're learned. They're learned. You know, I remember years ago doing a, a, a teaching on where did you learn when, when, when you said you were getting married. What did you really know about marriage? I mean, who, who was good at it? Not who said they was good at it, and who was so good at it that you got to watch them go through and not quit. And so by the time you go, you, you, you know, you're saying yes to something, but not yes to something sometimes that you're, you can, you, that, that you're connected to. Now, here's the beautiful thing about the Spirit of God. He can open your heart and your mind, and you can actually learn how to live with somebody very different from you. You really can but no one goes into a marriage or a relationship without that little thing in the back that thinks you're going to change somebody a little bit. I don't care if you think you're going, you think you're going to cook every night and now they're going to love you more. Or you're going to uh, uh, clean or you're going to say yes all the time. Even that sometimes is, a, is an opportunity for us to try to change someone else. And so to just live this life as my authentic self took a whole lot of dying. And I still have some dying to do to this flesh. I still have to put it under. Breaking historical agreements is about ridding yourself of learned behaviors. The agreements are what other humans around you have projected onto you and are now telling you what to believe. See, when, when we're talking about life and relationship and why things don't work sometimes, it's really what I believe. If, if, if you say something to me and you believe that I'm disrespecting you, then you're going to feel disrespected. Well, where did you get that from? Where, 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 do, where do we get these limitations from? Is it something that, that we have set and allowed the Spirit to show us what we care about? as individuals. So these agreements, that there were other humans around you have projected onto you and are now telling you what to believe. This is why you have to break historical agreements so that you can see what you would really believe if you didn't have somebody else's previous thoughts guiding you. Jill, what do you believe? What do you believe about life? What do you really believe about love? What did you really believe about marriage? What did you really believe about how it was to get along with people? What did you really believe? It, and it took some time to get to that self that was that real true self that was buried up under all of these other happenings in my life. That's why I'm not mad at the wilderness. That's why I'm not bothered from the wounds of a friend. Because you're actually loving me. And helping me. That's why I trained myself through the power and the strength of the spirit not to take things personally. That's why I, I do that work because if I don't do that work, then I am not 
This is how Jesus said, he said, he, Jesus or one of them said this, one of them biblical characters. He said, listen, certain things are not going to happen for you until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Until, Kirk, you can come in the name of the Lord and it doesn't feel good, and I can still say, blessed is my friend who couldn't, didn't say to me what I wanted to hear. There's some freedom is not, that's not going to happen. Why is that? Because as soon as God sends a servant or somebody at times, I, it's your children, it could be your children, it could be somebody at, on your job, but until you bless the blessing that God has sent to you, then there's some things that's just not going to happen. And I'm not telling you it's, it's easy. I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm saying, but if you keep yourself on a frequency, remember Isaiah 54, 13 says this, you will be taught by God. You will be called his disciples. <clears throat> what is it to be one of Jesus' disciples? You can't be one of those disciples and not like the truth. But we try to do that. Has the church lost the, lost the, the, the idea of what, that, that our goal is that when you finish, that your children, your sons, and those who follow you will be called the lost disciples. Not your friends only. Then, then, then how can I live in, in Isaiah 54, 13 if I have no idea what he taught his disciples? So he taught his disciples stuff like, um, stop trying to be first. Don't try to be first. He taught his disciples things like this. They will know you, that you are my disciples by the way you love one another. That's how they're going to know that you identify with me. What else, other kind of things that he teach his, was his disciples taught? Be anxious for nothing. Love your enemies, he said, and pray for those who use you. Because when you're able to do that, you will be called children of your father. But somehow we run to use that Bible to run around to find everything but that and those things. I want to see what God's, I want, I want to know God's plan for my life. His plan is for you to be a disciple, first and foremost. That you will be a follower of the Lord. Romans 4, 13 to 25, that's on your paper, right? Read it with me. It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world. Keep reading. But through the righteousness of that comes by faith. For if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless. Because law brings wrath. And where there is no law, transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace. It may be guaranteed to ho, 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 ho. He says, listen, you want to you want a guarantee to come into your household? He said, listen, you do it by faith so that this, so that what the promise that I'm giving you will be guaranteed to be in your children's lives. I can't guarantee you anything. But God can. He said, but if you live by the law, if the way you are carrying yourself, if the way you're trying to do this is more contractual than relationship, than relational. If you live by the law, then your kids, they, they're not going to understand the way of the spirit. I, I was talking to somebody the other day. I was on a, on a, on a a phone call the other day, and we were talking just about the importance of order and the importance of structure. Those things are very important, but they must be movable. How do you know that? Because the Ten Commandments were, were put in place for order. The Ten Commandments were not given to Abraham. They were given to Moses, which means Abraham was done. They were given to Moses. Here's my theory. They were given to Moses because Moses, and, Moses and, and that generation had been enslaved in Egypt. So those Ten Commandments would help rid you of the stress and the anxiety and the negativity that comes when you've been in slavery and then you've been let out. 
You want to know why a man will kill another man? See, that's why he gave those commandments. Because he understood you have been up under someone, someone has had their foot on your neck. And when you go free, we know the recidivism rate when it comes to prison. Why do people keep going back and they hate being in there? Because when you leave, your body may leave, but your mind is still traumatized by someone taking the right to your life. That's your birthright choice. It's your birthright. And someone has removed your birthright from you and told you to be okay with it. Well, you're only okay because you're in a cage. But once they let you out that cage, then we'll see. So envision that being the children of Israel. And God realizing, now when, when I bring them out, they're going to act like some people who used to be in the cage. So I got to give, and I'm going to put it in stone. Don't do this. You notice a good number, most of it is love me and love your neighbor. Because what happens when, when, when uh, 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 a whole bunch of folks live together and don't nobody have anything, and then all of a sudden they get to have a chance to get something? You see competition comes, come out, right? You see anger come out. You see jealousy come out. You see disappointment start happening in human beings. And he said, how am I going to get them to know? They're going to talk about this every day for 400 other generations plus some. Because that's how long it's going to take me to get that slave mindset out of them. I'm going to have to have them talk about something too every day. Then I'm going to have to make, tell you, talk to your children about it. Keep talking about it. Because if you don't keep talking about what I say, you're going to keep talking about what you think. And I want you to know that what you think is not what I put on your mind. It's what somebody else put on your mind. You're not talking from me. You're talking, this is coming from sometimes fear, anger, abandonment, and all those things that have nothing to do with the connection that God will have for you. So to get you back to what I call your organic self, there's a whole lot of fat that needs to be trimmed. So just what he said, let's pick up at verse 14. For if those who live by law are heirs, has no value and the promise is worthless because law brings wrath and where there is no law there is no transgression therefore the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring not only to those who are of the law but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham he is the father of us all as it is written I have made you a father of many nations he is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham and hope believed and so became the father. So shall your offspring be. Then listen to this. See, <laughs> what the wilderness do for you when you get out there with your bad self, with your I know so much self. Which you're, I'm so much better. I ain't who I used to be, you know. I ain't who I'm supposed to be, but I ain't who I used to be either. Okay, go on out there. Let me tell you something. All of that is right to think. But you ain't finished yet. There'll be another episode. The, the goal is that the next time you go through that episode, you have gained some muscle. The goal is if you keep working out, that you will not go into the, the gym working out with the same busted Demeanor. Because consistency will assure you that you will build muscle if you keep doing it and not just talking about it. Listen, without weakening in his faith. But before, before, before I do that, I want you to say to yourself, what is it going to mean for me to hope against hope? Listen, that's serious. That means all of what I think I knew, 
all of all of what I've already learned, everything I know, the good stuff, the wonderful stuff, the awesome stuff. At some point, it comes to a place where it's old news, and I got to get some new tools. Well, I have to be ready for this life that that actually happens this way. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Listen. First thing. You got to face the fact. Now, here's, just face the fact, but you don't, but, but, but just don't think that that fact you have is the only truth in the universe. Why must, you don't have to lie to yourself. Just go on and tell yourself the truth, but here's another truth. There is other truth. Here's another truth. You don't know all that God is going to do. Here's another truth. Eyes have not seen and ears have not heard what God will do for those who love him. That's another truth. And so there comes a time where I think I'm past something. You know, if, if I use my story, I, I, 20, from 2014 to the end of 2016, I'm in some kind of zone over my mother's estate. When I'm getting to come out, come out of that, I'm saying, oh, I'm so glad that's over. And then Deron gets sick. Now, 2016 happens. I am, at, I am still traumatized by what happened to me in that courtroom. But I think it's over. And when I finally get past all of the betrayal, including the lawyer, I say, God, I'm so glad I can breathe again. <clears throat> That's why 2017, y'all got a, the first blog with a book for me. <clears throat> because that is what, that's what, what freedom wanted me to do. So here comes 2017, and I'm writing a fast book. And I'm just excited, because guess what? I am free. Pharaoh or whoever, all that was, is off my back. And then the Ron head started hurting. It's 2017. I said, come on now. 2017 comes. Then we find out he, at least what the problem is, the headache's gone. Here come 2018. 2018, some other foolishness happens in relationship with me. And I'm saying, I got to go through this again? Uh-huh. One more thing? Uh-huh. By 2019, I'm here now. And I understand that trouble don't last always. And I also understand that, 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 that sometimes is, 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 what's, 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 the, what's the karate kid? Wax off. Uh, listen, listen. I'm telling you, man, you're going to be nice and waxed. <laughs> but it's wax off. But it's a wax on. And I remember times when I said, God, I don't know if I could. If this happened, I don't know what I would do. Now I know. I'm just going to live. I'm just going to live. My goal in this life is but to live and move forward with your attitude and not mine. That's my work. My work is not even to stay out of trouble anymore. My work isn't even to worry about trouble anymore. My work is when trouble comes to not forget who has the power. Because that's what it's meant to do, make you forget something in the midst of your fearful storm. But listen, without weakening his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Can you imagine that? Sarah, we are busted. You're so afraid to tell yourself the truth. This is Abraham. Listen, listen, y'all. I'm busted. I'm a hundred. My wife's womb is dead. Now, if somebody told him his stuff is dead, he'd have been mad. <laughs> My wife's womb is dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief. How did that happen? Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. 
but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Well, not just persuaded, but fully persuaded. See, 2015, 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18. That, that's called the school of, Jill was in the class of becoming fully persuaded. I thought I was fully persuaded. I thought I had faith to move mountains. I thought I believed, but I was believing for stuff that turned out to be a joke compared to what I had to believe for. And how I had to stand. But I had to see the providence of God. See, what did, what did Abraham say? He, see, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. Listen. Here's the promise of God. Um, you're going to set me free indeed. I'm going to know the life of being set free indeed. So, see, sometimes when you're in the wilderness, you start to start kind of thinking that God made some promises, that the promise is that you'll, you'll never be here again. That the promise is that you'll never go through again. The promise is, though your flesh may die, I'll see to it that your spirit lives. The promise is that when this is all said and done, we will meet again. Meaning, God, you, you will come home. The promise is that I am going to call out of you that which belongs to me, and then I'm going to leave to die that which doesn't. That's why he said flesh cannot inherit the kingdom. So that's my promise to you. And so there may be some other promises, but what happens during that time? You start, I, I, you can get in that feeling space. I just don't want my feelings hurt anymore. As long as you listen, Trump hurting your feelings right now, and he don't even live in your neighborhood. What's going on in the White House is irritating and, and frustrating. So this is a part of being in this world. God, how am I going to be in this world and not lose my life and stop acting as if I have died and gone to heaven already? No, I got to live in this flesh and through this flesh, with this flesh. And I got to do it all living for God. So on your paper, if, in these blank, blank lines, you're going to put your name, okay? When Jill is fully persuaded, that God has the power to do what he has promised, she recognized that the truth works. See, the truth works. When I recognize the truth works, I don't have to, I, my yeas can be yay and my nay can be nay. When I recognize that the truth works, I don't have to add anything or subtract anything. See, that for a long time, I didn't have the words, but, but, but someone would say, Jill, how, how, do you, how do I walk in God's truth? Because I believe it works. How, how, how am I taught by God? How do I, how do I believe I get to those places? Because I believe the truth works, even when I don't like it. I believe the truth works. And when you become fully persuaded that the truth works, you're going to be able to speak from your spirit of truth, no matter what. And I'm not talking about being nasty. I'm talking about being honest. Even when the person with you don't want your honesty. I'm not talking about name calling. I'm not talking about criticizing. I'm not talking about any of those kind of things. I'm talking about being true to how I really feel. Next one. When Jill is fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he has promised, she needs not choose falsehood. Denial, manipulation, nor deceit when facing present realities. When you believe that God has the power that he says he has, you can face the facts. You can face the fact you lose weight. You face the fact that you gain weight. You don't have to go tell everybody I gained weight, I lost. You don't have to have that conversation. I'm just talking. See, when you don't face the fact, then the lie stays inside. That, that, that self-division stays inside. And that huff comes out with other people. 
See, when I get up and I want to wear something, I know I can't fit what I used to be able to fit. See, because I walk in the truth, and I'm sure you do too. I'm not the only one that will do that. But I know when Deron says something to me and I feel it too much. I'm saying, now yesterday, this wouldn't even bother me. He would say worse things. Than this. Why am I so bothered by this? All you got to do is stop and get quiet for a minute. And you may find that there's a fact that you're not trying to face. And then sometimes the way we do, we choose not to face that fact is that we create another story that's not truth. That's not addressing the real situation. What is your real future? Why are you really saying? Listen, you don't have, I'm not telling you right now you have to tell anybody, but I'm telling you, go and just tell God, my womb is dead. Abraham is a hundred years old. And that's all I got to say. No pep talks. But Abraham, you know, you've been working the field. You still got muscles in your legs. I see you still. You're 100 years old. We busted. So that you can hear God come through. But a lot of times, the sadness, remember, depression often means that you are focused on the past. There's something back. There's something that you haven't resolved. Anxiety is often connected to worrying about the future because you can't predict it. When you're present, that's when you're at peace. Because you're living right, you're, you're, you're handling things that are in your power to handle. But you can't, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And oftentimes, the fear of tomorrow really had to do with with other things that didn't happen in the past the way we wanted them to. Until I went to school for myself, instead of saying, Deron, I believe that God said, you, you, you promised me that you would go to school when we first got married and you need to do it. And I just kept saying that you promised me. Well, he did say it. It was true. But why was his promise, him breaking his promise, what did it have to do with me? And why I didn't do what I was, what I really should have taken a chance to do. But guess what? I couldn't hear it. I couldn't, I didn't know what to do with it because I was too busy focusing on what he did or did not do. And I couldn't get to myself. Here we go. Verse 22. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Here we go. When Jill is fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he has promised, man's opinion becomes just that, something a person thinks. When you believe that God has the power to get your life, to guide you through the wilderness, to get you, uh, 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 to put you on a, on a path that he, no, listen, nobody can close the door that God is open. And nobody can open the door that God is closed. So stay away from both of them because you don't have the power to change that. The next one, when a person hopes against hope, she or he recognizes that the Apparent drying up of her available resources is not the end all. See, this is, this is what Abraham understood. My resources are dried up. Sarah is dried up, and I'm dried up. But it's not the end all. God, who is able to call things that are not as though they were, is the hope past hope. That's your hope past hope. But you got to give, we have to give God the opportunity to call things for us to be in a situation that is so beyond what we could do. Okay, here we go. Here's another one. When Jill finds herself in a tight spot, she must identify the basis of her confidence and who she is depending on. You're in a tight spot. Listen, listen. I'm telling you, this is all about being trapped by an untruth. 
Who are you depending to get you? When you with, listen, as long as I'm depending to Ron to get me out, with my back hit, get, get up against the wall, then um, I might start coming out like one of them she lines. Because I think that he has the promise for my life in his hands. And there are times I'll say to Ron, listen, you're killing me with this, that, and the other. But I can face that fact that what you're doing doesn't feel like promotion to me. But I don't take it no further than that. Because no matter what you're doing, my resources could dry up. But there's a hope past this hopelessness. There's a hope past this feeling. And it's all in God's promise. Why am I telling you this? Because until we get back connected to the sacredness of who God is in our lives, you're going to have the same troubles that the world has. With the same intensity that the world has. We all have the same trouble. But what God can say to me is, no weapon formed against you will prosper. So guess what? The weapon is formed, but it ain't going to prosper. I'm not going down like the world. Because I have something to reach for that's bigger than me. And I believe that. But until you do. So this we're going to do. They gave you another sheet of paper, right? Okay, no, no, no. Let, let me finish this real quick. In tight, in, in tight times, how do you reason with your thoughts that send a message that all is lost? When, t when things get tight, how, how, do you, how do you get yourself out of a tight spot? How do you deal with your thoughts? See, I believe, at least in my story, the, the tight spot, the, the door, the openings have been there, but it's my thoughts. See, Abraham's thoughts didn't get, Abraham could see his real situation. I'm busted, Sarah busted, but the sky is the limit. There's more, than, there's more than just this one situation right here. God, you got other doors you can open. There are other, there are other ways you can do it. And, and if you look at Hebrews, it says Abraham reasoned that if when, when it came to God and, and him having to take uh, uh, his son to as a sacrifice, he said he reasoned that God, listen, if I kill him, you're going to raise him from the dead because you promised me I was going to have some offspring. So I am not going to worry about an outcome that's yours. It's your outcome to make it. That's your job. I'm not getting caught up in those outcomes. God don't need my help. I saw this quote. The universe doesn't give you what you ask for with your thoughts. It gives you what you demand with your actions. It doesn't give you what you ask for with your thoughts. It gives you what you demand for your, your action. You say you want a better relationship, let your actions say so. You say you want to prosper or you want to, to, to grow in faith, let your actions show it. That means you're going to have to operate in that. On your paper, a note to my thoughts. You don't own me. You think, listen, I used to tell them, I'm, I'm going to take my life back from you. I have to take my life back from my own craziness. <laughs> I really thought that it was him. No. No. It was something inside me. So you all look at your next piece of paper. Okay. You got to. It's called a, a, t a title deed. You see it? I want you to look at your title deed. If you're looking online, there's. The lesson, this, this, this is online too, so you can pull it out and do this with us, okay? The title deed, you see it? When we take ownership, see, remember, slavery is about ownership. See, when I take my life back, I take back ownership of my life. And so... But when I take back ownership of my life, I take back the responsibility of my growth, of forgiveness, of love, and how relationships go with me. So today, we're going to take back ownership. Okay?
So here you go. Here's the sheet you all who's looking. I have two of them right here, so just look at the top one. Here's the sheet. You have it? Everyone in here has it? Everyone, I want everyone to have one. You, raise your hand if you don't have one. Everyone has one? We have extra. We have more than enough, okay? So listen to this. Title D. This is to certify that. Put your name on this line. So this is to certify that Chelsea has reclaimed the deed to her own life from her past. First step, take your life back from your past. She is transferring ownership from psychic slavery and distraction to self-acceptance and her intended purpose for life. Take it back. Here's a quote from Frederick Douglass. Such is the truth of man's right to liberty. He was born with it. It entered into the very idea of man's creation. It's your birthright. It was his before he comprehended it. It is, listen, this is written by a slave. At least a former slave. It's Frederick Douglass. It was his before he comprehended it. It is written upon all the powers and faculties of his soul. No one has that. You do. You just have to get to it. The title deed is in his own breast. The record of it is in the heart of God. Given under my hand and the seal of my word on, and my bond on this eighth, number eight, Day of April 29th, I mean May 2019. Come on now, fill it out. If you can write. If you can't write, somebody help you. Witness by. Now find somebody else in this room who gonna, who gonna witness. Not, I don't want your husband to witness this because y'all already lied to each other. <laughs> find somebody in your household since if you at home. To sign, you don't witness your own. This is your word and your bond. Somebody else has to put their name on your piece of paper. Now, I told you all, I created this little assignment for the ladies at D.C. Jail. So I figured, listen, they were so happy. They was running around, sign mine, sign mine. I'm mad that y'all not running around like them. So y'all y'all need to be locked down to appreciate. Now, of course, most of them came to me. Sign mine, sign mine. And this is what I told him, I tell it to you. If I see you on the street, wilding out, I'm going to remind you on May 8th that you said that you were taking your life back from psychic slavery. And that you said that you was going to put yourself in a position. Let, let, me, let, me, let me just read the first thing so I ain't got to. That you, that you are transferring ownership from psychic slavery and distraction to self-acceptance and your intended purpose for life. And if I see you out there acting nuts, I'm, I'm talking about even out in the unlock. I'm going to ask you, is this, why, this, is this your purpose? Are you walking in your purpose right now? Are you moving in purpose right now? When you're at home arguing with somebody, just ask each other. Now, this is what you can do with your husband and wife. Say, is this, is, are we in purpose right now? Did you get to do it? Listen, listen. I don't know which one of y'all, you know, who, who's, who's uh, hot today. You know, sometimes it's the wrong, sometimes it's me. One of us got to be, be sane while the other one is a little insane. And take point. But is this what God purposed for your life? To be arguing another human being that is made in the image of God. Down to the ground? I don't think so. Let's pray. Father, it is in your gracious, your precious, your almighty name. That we commit our souls and our spirit and our minds to you. Father, on this day, we declare that we will use the power that you have given us to take our thoughts captive and to not allow them to 
run or ruin our lives. Father, we thank you that this your word will wash us clean from head to toe. The baptism means, Father God, that our whole entire body will be covered. No part left out. Everything, everything is touched. I thank you for the strength right now, God, that you are releasing to anybody in this room and ATL or Facebook or Periscope. I thank you for the strength, Father God, right now you are releasing to them because they have taken this oath on paper. To not take lightly that psychic slavery that comes when we've had a troublesome past. But Father God, you are more than able and capable. You who raised Jesus from the dead in power, you are more than capable of raising us up too. We honor you, Father God, and we accept your truth in Jesus' name. Hallelujah and amen.